digestive systems. And within this, we're going to look at basic structures of the ruminant herbivore, non-ruminant herbivore, and carnivore slash omnivore monogastric species. So of course, an example of each, we've got cows are a good example of ruminants, as well as sheep and deer. We have horses as an example of a non-ruminant herbivore, as well as we've got rats and guinea pigs too. And then of course, a carnivore, we're talking about the cat. And for an omnivore, we're often talking about the dogs or animals that are like those, those animals, those creatures. So what animals eat, of course, herbivores eat uh, plant-based material. Ruminants are cattle and goats, non-ruminants, horses, rats, etc. Carnivores have a meat-based diet. Now you have to keep in mind too that they're not strictly required to eat only meat, that they tend to eat meat as their primary source of protein. Omnivores can eat a combination of plants and meat, and of course examples of that are humans, pigs, and dogs. When we're talking about carnivores in regard to domesticated animals, typically referring, we're referring to the cat. Cats are special, as always. Cats are pure carnivores, which means that they require meat to acquire taurine. And taurine is an amino acid that's necessary for the building of protein within the body. Dogs, they can derive it from other food sources. Cats can't. So cats who are put on a vegetarian diet because that's the trendy or cool thing to do, potentially can suffer from things like muscle weakness, heart fatigue, retinal degeneration, and blindness. So a whole bunch of these conditions that are affected because the animal's not building the right amount of protein that they should within those specific areas. So cats, as a general rule, we don't ever recommend cats to go on a 100% vegetarian diet. So digestion is the process that begins inside the, the gastrointestinal tract. The anatomical differences between gastrointestinal tracts, of course, they depend on what food the animal eats because they need specific mechanisms to break down each of those food sources. Digestion is the part of the process where large molecules are broken down into their smaller component parts and then, of course, when small enough, they work their way into the cellular layer and get absorbed in through the capillaries in the bloodstream. Within digestion, we've got mechanical digestion, which we'll talk about a fair bit, and then chemical digestion, as well as fermentative digestion as well. So we'll talk about the regulation of gastrointestinal functions. So they are regulated by various functions. We have the combination of central nervous system and endocrine system, and we have the enteric nervous system with intrinsic endocrine pan pan paracrine component. So the enteric CNS component is known as the brain of the gut, and it continuously sends signals back to the CNS about the status. So if the animal's hungry, if the animal's eating too much, that's where um, the enteric CNS will send signals back tell the body either to produce more hormones, less hormones, eat more, eat less, etc. As we know, the parasympathetic system is mainly responsible for an increase in gastrointestinal function, whereas the sympathetic nervous system shuts it down. Okay, The sympathetic nervous system, that fight-or-flight nervous system, when it is kicked on, it means that the animal needs to focus on breathing and having a decent uh, contractility in their heart. So we typically send all the blood up to the lungs and the heart and the brain with the par or with the sympathetic nervous system, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, that's that rest and recover, and it increases the amount of motion within the GI tract. So we're going to go through the gastrointestinal tract component parts. I just wanted to point out to start with, we don't focus a lot in this PowerPoint about the sort of upper digestive portions. So within this model here, we'll talk about this in our respiratory component as well, because some of these are shared features of respiration and digestion. So of course we've got the mouth, easy to see. And then the heart palate is the area that sits uh, deep to the maxillary teeth. So deep to the upper teeth, it's right above the upper teeth. And of course, if you put your tongue against the roof of your mouth, you're touching your hard palate. As we work our way back, the soft palate is that softened tissue past the hard palate, just sort of basically creating the back of the throat. The tongue we'll talk about in detail. The pharynx here, 
if I can find my mouse. So the pharynx is, of course, the shared passageway that is the throat itself. And it's the shared passageway between the respiratory system and the digestive system. Right here we have the larynx. And the larynx is the opening to the trachea. So the larynx also houses our vocal cords, which we'll talk about later on, but it's the entrance to the trachea itself, which means that it's the entrance to the respiratory tract. And one really important feature is the epiglottis, which is a small little piece of connective tissue that sits on top of the trachea at the opening of the trachea, and it just prevents food and water from going down into the trachea and into the lungs. So looking at the tongue, it's a muscular structure on the ventral surface in the oral cavity. It has three parts. It has the apex, the body, and the root. There's papillae on the dorsal surface, so these tiny little finger-like projections. And they have mechanical functions, such as grooming and moving food into the uh, pharynx, so into the throat. And then they also have specialized functions. So they have beneficial um, components, such as taste sensations, pain, temperature gauging, touch, and thermoregulation through panting. So there's a lot of blood vessels in the tongue, as you've probably known if you've ever bitten your tongue, it bleeds like crazy. And the super, superficial positioning of some of these blood vessels, especially in the dog, reflects the additional function of the tongue to thermoregulate through panting. So they'll open up their mouth, stick out their tongue, and allow those little superficial capillaries to be exposed a little bit more to the outside air in an effort to cool their body temperature down. Now the apex is the freely movable portion of the tongue uh, through here. The body of the tongue is sort of the middle aspect of the tongue. So the body connects the apex to the root and the root of the tongue, you can't see on this picture, but it's attached to the base of the mandible and to the hyoid bone. And if you remember our hyoid apparatus, it's kind of a funky U-shape set of bones that connects to the base of the mandible, also to the larynx, and essentially it secures the epiglottis in place and it also secures the base of the tongue. So it assists in swallowing is one important feature about the hyoid apparatus. So then we have salivary glands. They, in general, saliva production varies depending on the species. Some species produce digestive enzymes, some do not. So the composition overall is watery, it's fairly viscous, so fairly thick, or it could be mixed. And again, it depends on how much saliva they're producing and for what purpose. Mainly it's made up of water and then various enzymes as well. The function is, of course, lubrication of the food that's in the mouth, antibacterial action, pH regulation, thermoregulation, and enzymatic digestion. So looking at who produces those um, digestive enzymes such as amylase, amylase is a common digestive enzyme that starts to break down starches into simple sugars within the mouth. The species that produce a lot of amylase are pigs, and horses produce a small amount. Cows, dogs, and cats do not produce amylase in their saliva. Everybody in general produces amylase in their pancreas as well, so there's another opportunity for amylase to work on the body, but specifically pigs and horses will produce amylase in their saliva to help start that breakdown and that digestion. Now the animals, we looked at this one previously in one of our anatomical PowerPoints, so most mammals have at least three pairs of salivary glands, so they have three main pairs and then they might have an accessory pair called the zygomatic glands. So the three key glands of interest are the sublingual gland, the mandibular gland, and the parotid gland. They provide the majority of the mucus. The zygomatic is an accessory gland which provides some mucus, or not mucus, of the saliva. So the zygomatic gland produces some saliva, but not it's not reliant on the zygomatic gland to produce copious amounts of saliva. So prehension, we talked about that's the grasping of food, and of course animals use either their lips, their tongue, or their teeth. Chewing is mastication. Salivary secretion, that's regulated by the nervous system, and it's also conditioned responses, so it's also uh, triggered by conditioned responses. Swallowing is also known as deglutition, 
It's voluntary, it's in the pharyngeal stage, and then in the esophageal stage, it initiates the act of peristalsis. So looking at conditioned responses, if we think about Pavlov's dog and Pavlov's classical conditioning, they had, this is how it worked, essentially the dog, Pavlov recognized that the dog would drool when food comes around. So that's that's on its own um, an unconditioned response. So the dog starts to drool when food's around. Before conditioning, if they had a whistle, of course the dog wouldn't drool. And then they started pairing the whistle with the food. And then after conditioning, the dog would just drool when it saw the whistle. So if we start having things that we pair together, like a dog bowl, if the dog sees its bowl, even though it's empty, sometimes the dog might start drooling. That's considered a conditioned response. In the abdominal cavity, we have that peritoneum, which is that big membrane found in the abdominal cavity that surrounds the whole capsule of the abdominal cavity. One thing to remember, of course, is that kidneys do not sit within this. All the other visceral organs sit within the peritoneum, except for the kidneys, because they're different. They sit retroperitoneal. And within these layers, we have the visceral peritoneum, parietal peritoneum, mesentery, and omentum. And we'll talk about each of those. Some of those, actually. So the omentum is a double layer, and it's an extension of the peritoneum. It's an extension of that membrane. It connects the peritoneum that links the stomach to the abdominal wall or to other organs. So typically, when we open an animal up for space surgery, the first thing that is apparent to us is this big pad of omental fat. Really common. This is what it looks like in reality. So when we look at it, you can sort of bring it out of the body, totally normal, but it's just this big layer of omental fat. And within this omentum, of course, as well, are we've got capillaries, we have arterioles and venules too, as well as some lymphatic structures. Actually, I'm just going to go back to this one. So what this does too, this picture is demonstrating what the omentum looks like. One clinical application of the omentum that's kind of neat, if a surgeon is performing a surgery on an abdominal organ and they have to incise into that organ, they can actually wrap the organ, after they've sutured it closed, they can wrap the organ with omentum to promote healing. So when it's used in this fashion, the omentum actually promotes vascularization, so it brings the, the blood supply back, and it brings fibroblasts, life's little cellular band-aids, back to the surgical site and enhances healing. So that's kind of neat specifically that they can wrap organs in omentum to promote healing. So looking at this one here, what we're looking at is of course, this is little dog, this is its penis on the ventral aspect of its abdomen, and then this is an umbilical hernia. So an umbilical hernia occurs when the abdominal wall hasn't fully closed and there's a small gap within the abdominal muscle. Typically, what we're seeing in this case is a little piece of omental fat that is pushing through the abdominal wall and out to the outside of the body. Now, that's the best case scenario, of course. If it's a large hernia, then there's always risk that abdominal organs or blood vessels could actually get caught. So anytime an animal has an abdominal um, hernia or an inguinal, or sorry, umbilical hernia or an inguinal hernia, it's recommended just to perform surgery and close that up very fairly easily. But it just prevents those long-term issues. So the functions of the stomach in monogastric carnivores and herbivores, and as well as ruminants to a degree, is storage of ingested food, mechanical and chemical breakdown of food, and production of intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 absorption. So the small intestine will absorb the vitamin B12, but it relies on the production of intrinsic factor in order to be able to make that happen. So food leaves the stomach in semi-liquid form. We call that chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, and chyme is hypertonic. So what that means is it has it's a higher concentration of ions within the chyme itself, and it will draw fluid out of the vascular space and into the small intestine. The body regulates the slow release of chyme from the stomach to ensure that we don't get a big drop in blood pressure because the body is now taking a whole bunch of water from the vessels into the small intestine, but also to ensure that the acid is well buffered because chyme is really acidic. 
So if the body just continuously pumps a whole bunch of chyme into the small intestine, the duodenum won't be able to compensate for that and it will get burned and it can get ulcerated. So that's a protective feature. So looking at our animal groups and their stomach types, in monogast, we have monogastric. So that could be carnivore or herbivore or hindgut fermenter. They have simple, single stomach designs. Examples of that, of course, are dogs, cats, and horses. And then we have ruminants, which have complex stomachs consisting of four chambers, including one true stomach. And those, of course, could be cows, goats, and sheep. So the monogastric stomach, it is C-shaped and it's located just caudal to the diaphragm. It's in the left cranial abdomen. So when an animal is placed on its back for x-ray, for radiographs, we're assuming that this is the left side, even though we don't have the marker there. So this here is the stomach, this little gassy pouch here <coughs> with some foodstuffs in it as well. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> So the stomach lives in the cranial left abdomen. There's glandular portions, which include gastric pits for secretion, and you'll find those within pretty much every area of the stomach, but the cardia, the fundus and body, and the pylorus. This is a pretty common look for a gastric pit. They are different glandular cells, each with their own different secretions. We have mucus neck cells, chief cells, parietal cells are some of them. And we'll go through those in a little bit more detail. So the cells that secrete within the cardia region of the stomach are goblet cells. And goblet cells secrete thick alkaline mucus. This, of course, is a protect protective feature of the stomach in that it secretes this thick alkaline mucus to coat the lining of the stomach so that it doesn't get burned by the acid. And likewise, the mucus is alkaline, so it helps buffer that acid as well. So this is an important protective feature. And then we have in the fundus and body, we have parietal cells, which are responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid, so hydrogen and chloride mixed together, as well as intrinsic factor. And as mentioned before, intrinsic factor is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestines. The cat, however, is a bit different, and they require the pancreas to secrete intrinsic factor. Then there are mucus neck cells, which produce a thinner, less viscous, and chief cells, which secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen. So pepsinogen is the first product in a series that creates pepsin which is a proteolytic enzyme. So proteolytic means that it breaks down proteins. It's essential in the digestive process and it begins the chemical digestions of proteins within the stomach. Activated in the fun fundus, pepsinogen is secreted by those chief cells and then pepsinogen is converted to pepsin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. HCl breaks down the proteins in the stomach as well as pepsin, which is running around within the stomach now, breaking down the proteins. So this, oddly enough, is a protective feature as well for the fact that it has to be converted to pepsin. So if we had pepsin floating around in the stomach all the time, then it would be producing a fair bit of protein digestion, which means in the end, if it was continuously circulating in the stomach and not just at times of digestion, then it would start to break down the cells within the stomach itself and the tissues. So again, protective feature, the fact that pepsin, or sorry, pepsinogen has to be converted in order to become that proteolytic pepsin. So within the pylorus, we have goblet cells that secrete mucus and G cells that secrete gastrin. So what causes those stomach cells to secrete? We have three substances that stimulate secretions by glandular cells. Acetylcholine from cholinergic neurons gastrin, released by the G cells, and histamine, secreted by enterochromaffin-like cells in gastric mucosa. When these are in action, they're causing an increase in uh, secretions through all these cells, which in turn creates increased secretion of hydrochloric acid. Looking at the monogastric stomach motility, so that's the rate of movement of the stomach and just in general the, the action of the stomach, so what sends it into action. Each part differs 
in regard to the stomach and the degree of movement based on its function. So the fundus of the monogastric carnivore or um, omnivore stomach, the fundus expands to accommodate large volumes of food. That's that part that stretches a lot when we overeat. The body is a large mixing chamber. A lot of mechanical digestion takes place here. And the pyloric antrum acts like a pump. The pyloric antrum is pretty cool. It is in itself a protective feature for the duodenum. If the pyloric antrum just allowed food to pass or chyme to pass, just to pass on to the duodenum without pulsing it through, we would have a huge influx of acidic chyme in the duodenum. And of course, if there's too much chyme in the duodenum, it can't handle the acidity and it would start to burn the duodenal layer. So in this case, the pyloric antrum acts as a protective barrier or protective mechanism because it pulses and reduces the amount of chyme that can get passed through to the duodenum at each time. So then the duodenum actually has time to initiate processes such as the secretion of bicarbonate, etc. Peristaltic contractions we've learned all about. These fragment the food into smaller particles and they influence the rate of gastric emptying. They're weak in the fundus in the body of the stomach, and they get progressively stronger as the food moves toward the pylorus. Large particles are prevented from leaving the stomach, so they'll get sent back up into the stomach using retropulsion to ensure that they get appropriately digested. The control of gastric motility, so the control of setting the stomach into action, is, is spearheaded by neurohumoral control. So what neurohumoral control means is a mix of neurotransmitters and the central nervous system, as well as hormones. So we're looking at neurotransmitters, fibers of the vagus nerve, synapse on cells in the gastric myenteric plexus. So for this, motility decreases when food enters, so it allows it time to undergo changes to secrete acid and to go through gastric motility. And then motility increases when food approaches the pyloric region. Acetylcholine is released in the pyloric region, and this increases peristaltic contractions. Hormones that have an effect, of course, are gastrin, which stimulate the release of hydrochloric acid. So a little bit about the vagus nerve. You can see it here, running down through the body. The vagus nerve impacts the rate of gastromotility the most compared to gastrin. And the vagus nerve itself is the 10th cranial nerve, and it plays a really large role in the heart and lungs and digestion. Gastric emptying, so the rate at which the chyme leaves the stomach, is controlled. It's controlled by the strength of the pyloric muscle contractions and the degree of contractions of the pyloric sphincter. The hormones released by the small intestine can also delay gastric emptying. That's a protective feature that we'll talk about. Secretin, cholecystokinin, and gastric inhibitory peptide are all hormones that are released that slow down the gastric emptying time. And again, protective feature because it allows the duodenum to prepare itself for the influx of acid. So looking at this x-ray here, we have one little mechanism. Sometimes we do sort of studies, diagnostic studies, to determine the rate of gastric emptying for dogs and cats. It can help assist in the diagnosis, so it can be a diagnostic tool. These little things on the bottom here, these are called BIPs. And they're small capsules that contain small and large radio-opaque beads. So radiopaque means that they show up really well on x-ray, and then you can see them in the x-ray itself. Right here, we have small bips and large bips making their way through this very, very gassy colon. So what this allows us to do, of course, sometimes we'll use them if we're concerned about an animal having a foreign body, and it gives us an idea of where everything is stopping within the GI tract. Likewise, in regard to gastric emptying, we can time it, create a sort of an equation that gives us an overall gastric emptying time based on how long these beads go from being in the mouth to exiting the stomach. All right, components in the meal. We're gonna talk a little bit now about the breakdown of each of these. To a degree, we don't talk too much about the minerals and vitamins. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins, and minerals are all the key components of our nutrient requirements. When we're talking about terminology, starches are made of repeating glucose monosaccharides. Sugars are simple mono monosaccharides, or they can be multiple monosaccharides linked together, such as disaccharides, sucrose, and lactose. 
Cellulose is a complex carbohydrate, and we'll talk a bit about cellulose coming up. Proteins are made of repeating amino acid chains. A chain of greater than 50 is called a protein, and a chain of less than 50 is called a peptide. And lipids, the majority of fat found in an animal's diet, of course, is a lipid, and it's made of a glycerol backbone with three fatty acids attached to it, which of course determines what kind of lipid it is. Chemical digestion is involved in all of these breakdowns, as well as mechanical digestion. So mechanical digestion, of course, is continuous throughout the GI tract. Carbohydrate digestion, depending on the species, it might begin with amylase in the saliva. So we know that horses have a little bit of amylase in their saliva, and pigs have quite a bit. But dogs, cats, and cows, they don't typically have amylase in their saliva to start that starch or carbohydrate breakdown. It does continue in the stomach and small intestine. Protein digestion begins in the stomach and continues in the small intestine. Pepsinogen is activated by HCL to cause, or sorry, to create pepsin. Pepsin, of course, is proteolytic, which means it breaks down the proteins. Moving on to the ruminant stomach, it, of course, has four chambers. The first three chambers are the four stomachs. They are the reticulum, the rumen, and the omasum. The last chamber and true stomach is the abomasum. Ruminants, of course, are herbivores. These include cows, sheep, goats, deer, reindeer, moose, etc. And they requ require more complex digestion process than carnivores. Their four stomachs are non-glandular, and they have heaps and heaps of microorganisms for fermentation in the rumen and in the reticulum. The complex carbohydrates, i.e. the cellulose, is broken down in this area. So because the complex carbohydrates are plant-based material, they have a cell wall, so unlike animal-based material, which would have a cell membrane, plant-based material, of course, has a cell wall. And this is the main reason that thick protective cell wall is the main reason that carnivores and omnivores have challenges digesting this cellulose, this complex carbohydrate. So ruminants rely heavily on their microbes, so their mix of bacteria, fungi, and protozoans within their rumen and their ruminant, or sorry, within their reticulum and their rumen in order to break down the cell wall and be able to absorb the nutrients that come from those complex carbohydrates. The abomasum functions pretty much the same as a monogastric stomach with a little exception. So the four stomachs, we have the rumen, which is also known as the paunch, and this is where the majority of microorganisms ferment carbohydrates to break down those cell walls. Papillae in the mucosa increase the surface area for absorption. And remember, they're not secreting within this area. And pillars divide the rumen into the dorsal sac, ventral sac, and the two caudal sacs. The reticulum is also known as the honeycomb. It has that honeycomb appearance. It's located cranial to the rumen. It's much smaller than the rumen. And the contents easily enter and exit the rumen. So for this, we often call it the reticulorumen. We just consider the two of them working so closely together that they start to share a name. In young ruminants, they have an esophageal groove. So this links the esophagus with the omasum in the young animals, in the young ruminants. Milk for nursing ruminants will then bypass the reticular rumen, and that milk that comes down the esophagus goes directly to the omasum and the abomasum. If the groove didn't close, bacteria in the reticular rumen would ferment the milk making it not available for the cow to use or the calf to use. And it would also cause a buildup in lactic acid, which is of course a byproduct of bacterial fermentation. So our clinical applications, when we have young calves, young sheep, lambs, goats, whatever it may be, if they're ruminants, in general with young animals, if we're bottle feeding them, we have to go very slowly and we have to be very, very careful. But quite often people get into a rush or they think that the calf is taking the milk, but it's not. So some people get into the habit of, of fast feeding milk, either with a bottle or with a bucket. If we fast feed the milk, the milk will overwhelm the esophageal groove and it will enter straight into the rumen instead of the omasum. <clears throat> From here, the bacteria in the rumen isn't developed enough to digest the milk so then it inappropriately digests it, so then we end up spoiling some of the milk and creating that lactic acid buildup, which is not ideal, causes a lot of pain, 
but also, too, the proteins in the milk aren't going to be absorbed by the calf. So the milk overall is not appropriately processed, and it ends up with gut ache, and it can result in long-term scar tissue in the rumen, affecting the future of that calf's production. So it could actually end up in euthanasia if it's severe enough. You also end up with a calf who won't eat due to pain, or if they're continuously getting fast-fed with milk, they're just going to continue to lose weight, lose muscle, because they're not actually getting what they need from the milk. Scary stuff. So always, always keep that in mind because you will be, at some point, if you're in the class that I'm teaching, you will be probably bottle feeding calves and lambs at some point in your life. So because the milk is not processed and broken down adequately, they're not getting the nutrition that they need from it. And because of the lack of breakdown, there's an overabundance of lactose in the small intestine, which results in diarrhea, also known as scours. So never fast feed milk. Moving on, we have the omasum, which is also known as many piles or book stomach, and it connects the reticular rumen to the abomasum. Folds of mucosa with papillae on each surface, of course, and it's involved in absorption and increase of surface area. But absorption of water and of salts occurs here. And then we have the true stomach called the abomasum, which is lined with glandular tissue. So this is the area, of course, that the glandular secretions begin. This abomasum releases renin, which causes milk protein coagulation. And this is a protective feature because it prolongs the time for pepsin to break down the proteins. So it ensures that the milk is mechanically broken down well enough within the abomasum and gives the body time to actually break it down thoroughly in order to absorb appropriately. The abomasum generally functions like a simple monogastric stomach as mentioned before. The key difference is it does not act as a storage compartment the way our monogastric individuals have the fundus, which creates that large storage compartment. The abomasum does not have that feature. And the abomasum, essentially there's a continuous flow of ingesta into the abomasum, and then it quietly just works its way through and digests slowly and pulses it into the small intestine. Contractions in the reticular rumen, they have two main types. There's primary contractions, which are the big mixing contractions. They ensure the content movements between reticulum and rumen, so it's continuous back and forth, and they separate particles based on size. So here you can see that gases stay at the top, and there are a lot of gases with ruminants because it's a byproduct of fermentation. And then of course the hay eaten today, today's grain, and hay eaten yesterday. So those components that are well digested will hang out toward the bottom, middle digestion hang out toward the top so that they can be sent back up for uh, chewing their cud. So sent back up their esophagus into their mouth to be re-mechanically re digested in their mouth. And then a funny great benefit of cattle and ruminants is that they need to burp. Burping is a necessity for them. Eructation or eructation is another word for belching. And this is created by the secondary contractions of the rumen, reticular rumen. This is responsible for the release of gases. Carbon dioxide and methane are produced. They're those byproducts that are produced from fermentation. Without gas release, develop, they would definitely develop bloat, which we talked about previously. The area, there's an area of the brainstem that controls this reticuloruminal activity, including indicating when they need to burp. The reticulorumin ecosystem is really amazing. It's mostly controlled, as an adult animal, it's mostly controlled by current diet, so what they're eating. It has a huge variety of bacteria, protozoa, and fungi, and there's a proper balance between types acquired after birth. Again, most of it's reliant on the diet, so I think about times that you might have the sheep in all winter, and they've been eating, you know, last year's hay, and they've been eating maybe some grain if they're lactating. If we were to let them out to graze on really rich, really brand new spring grasses, quite often it will shift their flora within their gut and they won't quite be able to digest it right away. So a lot of times if we give them the wrong diet or a really rich diet and they haven't slowly developed the right bacteria and microbes to process it, they end up with a ton of gas, which can be extremely uncomfortable. 
So really, really heavily controlled by diet or influenced by diet. It's also by the interactions between the mother and young, depending on how old the animal is. And oxygen is also digested with the food or ingested with the food to help supply some of those microbes. So carbohydrate di digestion and ruminants. The ruminants diet, as we mentioned before, is mostly grasses and mostly complex carbohydrates within that. So we've got cellulose, hemicellulose, and pectin. Sometimes we give them grains which are non-structural carbohydrates, such as starches, fru fructosans, and simple sugars. The microorganisms are amazing, and they use the nutrients consumed for their own growth and development as well. So then, of course, they can replicate and continue to populate that reticular rumen. Ruminants can digest the microorganisms as well as a source of protein, which always, I love that. I think that's a great adaptive, adaptive feature. Complex car carbohydrates are broken down through hydro hydrolysis by catalase enzymes into simple sugars. Starches and soluble sugars are broken down through hydrolysis by amyolytic bacteria to monosaccharides and polysaccharides. And saccharides are absorbed by the microvilli and further metabolized to pyruvate and converted into volatile fatty acids. Now, volatile fatty acids are extremely important in these ruminants and also in hindgut fermenters. 70%, 70% of their energy requirements are met through the absorption of volatile fatty acids. So you can imagine if we are feeding an inappropriate meal to ruminants or inappropriate feed overall, they definitely wouldn't be getting the VFAs that they need in order to survive. Lipid digestion ruminants, microorganisms in the reticular rumen, hydrolyzed triglycerides. So the VFAs are produced and they're used to produce energy or they're stored through the breakdown of fat. Proteins, the nutrients in food, are first available to the microbes in the reticular rumen. So they're offered to the microbes for breakdown. They're further broken down in small intestine by enzymatic action and transported to the liver. The amino acids are metabolized, urea is produced, goes back to the rumen, and then the saliva for reuse in making microbial proteins. So overall, the microbes in the ruminant gastrointestinal system are so important. If they didn't have the microbes, these little super microbes, they wouldn't be able to break down their carbohydrates, their fats, and their proteins. So again, if we have a shift where the animal has a poor makeup of reticular rumen, microbes and bacteria, then of course they're not going to be digesting properly and they can become malnourished pretty quickly. Glucose production in ruminants. So the ruminal microbes are, they process their carbohydrates before they're exposed to the intestinal enzymes. So they kind of go through and take what they need in regard to their own sugar requirements or energy requirements, which essentially creates a potential glucose deficiency. Gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver from non-carbohydrate sources, so that's the production of glucose or the production of sugar overall from non-carbohydrate sources, and VFAs are sent directly to the liver for breakdown into glucose. They also send glucose to the liver for conservation and storage. So moving on to the small intestine, adaptations help increase the surface area. So we've talked about this in a fair bit of detail. They have folds within the mucosal lining. They have villi, which are these macroscopic little finger-like projections. And then, of course, they have microvilli, which is a tiny little finger-like projections on the actual cells that line their mucosa. There's also these intestinal crypts called the crypts of Langerhan. All these folds and passageways within the gastrointestinal tract help increase surface area for absorption. Secretions from the duodenal mucosa. We have a couple of protective features here. Cholecystokinin is released from the duodenum. Functions are to inhibit gastric emptying and cause increased secretion of bicarbonate and pancreatic digestive enzymes. Stimulus for secretion is high amino acid or fatty acid concentrations or low pH of chyme entering into the duodenum. So if the duodenum recognizes that it's very, very acidic chyme coming into the duodenum, or if there's high amino acid or really fatty acid concentrations, then it's going to release cholecystokinin to inhibit that gastric emptying and give it time to prepare 
So when it's inhibiting the gastric emptying, it's also increased the secretion of bicarbonate and pancreatic digestive enzymes so that it can actually tackle the chyme that's coming through. Secretin, the functions are similar to decrease the hydrochloric acid production in the stomach and increase, again, those pancreatic uh, and biliary bicarbonate secretions. So these are two protective features of the duodenum so that it doesn't get overloaded with chyme, which is really acidic, and then, of course, could burn the inside of the duodenum. The pancreas, we know it has a couple, fu couple functions. It has tons of functions, but it functions within the endocrine system and then as well within the digestive system. For the digestive system specifically, we're mostly going to talk it, about it, or we have talked about it, in regard to secretion of bicarbonate and digestive enzymes into the duodenum. The liver, the bile duct, and the gallbladder. So this is a fairly big topic. The liver is the largest digestive gland in the body, and it has lots of functions. Not all of them are related to digestion specifically. If we look at where the liver is located in the body, it's the cranial most organ in the abdominal cavity. So we can assume that this is the thorax up here. We have the diaphragm, and directly caudal to the diaphragm is the liver. The liver is bilobed, and the stomach kind of sits in between the two lobes, depending on the species, but for definitely for monogastric, it does. Functions of the liver are to secrete substances essential for digestion and absorption of nutrients, and it synthesizes nutrients and regulates their release into the bloodstream. It excretes toxic substances, those originating from within and outside the body, and it produces plasma proteins, cholesterol, and blood coagulation factors. The liver has two surfaces. It has a diaphragmatic surface, which is attached with the falciform ligament, and it has a visceral surface. The falciform ligament attaches the liver to the body wall and separates the liver into the left and right lobes. It's strategically placed in the body to process blood, leaving the gastrointestinal tract, and it prevents toxic substances from entering into general circulation. This area is known as the triad, and it's the hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery, and the bile ducts. Clinical application. So essentially the way the liver works, it has veins that connect it to the digestive tract. So into the intestines, blood that's absorbed from that partially digested material gets sent to the liver. So it gets rerouted to the liver before it goes into general systemic circulation. Because that blood coming from the gastrointestinal tract, it has some things that the body needs, and it has some toxins in it still that the body doesn't need. And that's why it goes back up to the liver to ensure that the liver can sort out the nutrients that we need and then possibly the toxins that we don't need. So a clinical application of this is portosystemic vascular anomalies, also known as portosystemic shunts. And this is an underdevelopment of the vasculature between the digestive tract and the liver. Blood from the digestive tract is directly sent into regular circulation instead of going up to the liver to be cleaned by the liver. Who does it affect? So this condition can affect dogs and cats typically, can affect other mammals as well, but typically young dogs and cats because it's a congenital defect, so they're born with it. Normally, we start to see clinical signs in cats by six months of age and dogs by one year of age. The clinical signs common to this illness are failure to thrive, which means that they just don't get as big and as bouncy and vivacious as their brothers and sisters in the litter. They tend to be underweight, have less muscle. They sometimes are salivating a lot. They're nauseous. They might be vomiting intermittent diarrhea, anorexia, it goes on and on and on. Vocalization, PUPD, etc. So the main thing that we're recognizing here are those little guys who just are not thriving in the same way that their brothers and sisters. So for these little guys, surgery is an option and the surgery aims to reconnect the blood flow through the liver. So it takes that blood flow from the gastrointestinal tract, which is currently being rerouted into general circulation, and it connects it back to the liver so that the blood can actually be cleaned as it's before it goes into general circulation. It works really well. Surgery works really well um, for most cases, depending. 
less successful in cats, more successful in dogs. And as always, it's most successful if just one shunt is present. So what that means is if it's just one vessel that's avoiding the liver, that's more easily reconnected to redistribute the blood through the liver. Whereas if they have numerous vessels that are skipping out on the liver, that can be more challenging and less successful. Sometimes we can manage them with diet as well. So some less severe dogs specifically can be maintained on specific diets that help support hepatic insufficiency. So those are portosystemic shunts. Typically too, it tends to happen in Yorkies. Yorkies are known, tiny little Yorkies are known for getting these portosystemic shunts. The gallbladder. The gallbladder concentrates and stores bile until it's needed. And then bile enters the duodenum to emulsify high fat and digest peptide concentrations. It provides means for the liver to excrete waste products as well because it's going back into the gastrointestinal tract for excretion. Composition of bile includes bile salts, phospholipids, cholesterol, and bile pigments. And one thing that we sometimes test to identify changes in liver function are tests, blood tests for bile salts because bile salts should be excreted through the bowel movement. So if we're having, we can test for bile salts in the blood. And this is just a quick photo to identify the differences in the emptying of the bile duct, which is the common vessel that runs from the gallbladder into the duodenum. So here, the bile duct itself, we can see in the dog, which is A, and the cat, which is B. In the dog, it connects to the pancreatic duct, right? So we've got the pancre we've got accessory pancreatic duct, pancreatic duct, bile duct, then empties into that whole pancreatic duct passageway, and then gets secreted into the duodenum. Whereas in the cat, the bile duct empties directly by itself into the duodenum. So two differences based on species. Elimination of bilirubin through bile. Bilirubin is all about RBC breakdown. So red blood cells are broken down in the liver because they only live to about three months of age, right? They circulate for about three months in the body and then they become old and useless and they get broken down. So they get sent to the liver for breakdown. The heme, part of hemoglobin, the heme is converted to free or unconjugated bilirubin. The free bilirubin is joined in the liver to form the water-soluble conjugated bilirubin. This is then released into the bile and enters into the small intestine. Most of it is oxidized to urobilin and sterco stercobilin. Stercobilin is excreted from the body in the feces. It's responsible for the brown color of feces. And urobilin is excreted by the kidneys in the urine and it's responsible for the urine's yellow color. So the key features here are that heme a breakdown of heme, of course, becomes bilirubin, which it happens when red blood cells are sent to the liver for breakdown after about three months. And that ster stercobilin is excreted from the body in the feces, creates the brown color, and urobilin is excreted from the kidneys, or by the kidneys, as urine, and it creates the yellow color. Unfortunately, when the liver is not functioning appropriately, we get an increase in bilirubin. And bilirubin, when we think about it in the body, is generally associated with a yellow color. So bilirubin in the urine is a yellow-orange color. Bilirubin in the blood, it creates this yellow color all throughout the body. So if we have hyperbilirubinemia, that means that there's an increase in bilirubin circulating in the bloodstream, and the animal becomes jaundiced. And jaundiced is that yellow color. Quite often we see jaundice when we're looking at an animal in the inside pinna of their ears. That's an easy area to see. The most important part to check, of course, is their mucous membranes, so we flip up their lip to identify what color their mucous membranes are. You can also see jaundice quite well in the sclera of their eyes, and it can even change the color of an animal's eyes because it's so much yellow. Various conditions can cause liver failure and liver disease, or at least jaundice because these ones are affecting the liver. 
immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. That's um, an immune condition, of course, where the body's attacking its own red blood cells. So the animal becomes very anemic because it's low on red blood cells. And it also becomes jaundice because it's breaking down red blood cells at an increased rate and the liver can't process that much bilirubin. <clears throat> Leptospirosis is a virus that definitely will affect the liver. That one's also zoonotic, so we have to be careful because we can catch it through the urine. Fatty liver disease is the breakdown of the liver after a while when a cat or a dog, but typically cats, if they don't eat for a period of days, they can start to get fatty liver disease. There are a lot of cancers that affect the liver as well. And then hemobartonella is a blood parasite that causes destruction of red blood cells, which essentially ends up causing an increase in bilirubin, overloading the body. Bilirubinuria is bilirubin found in the urine. If correct, so if it's true that we're seeing bilirubinuria, the kidneys are overloaded with the high level of bilirubin from the blood, and it's excreted or dumped into the urine. The way we check for this is with a dipstick. The caution is that we have a high level of false positives on dipstick, so we can never use this to diagnose. We don't diagnose anyways, the vets do, but we would never use this as the one and only diagnostic tool to create a diagnosis for liver disease or liver failure. Okay, blood bilirubin is the most accurate and they technically would go hand in hand. Now, if we look at the urines at the bottom of the page here, this one in particular, this sort of orangey yellow, is pretty common look for bilirubinuria. So nutrient processing by the liver, it has a vital role in keeping blood glucose levels normal in the non-ruminant. This does this by glucose absorbed from the small intestine. It enters the hepatic portal vein. It arrives in the liver and it's metabolized to produce energy. Fructose and galactose can be converted to glucose by the liver. Excess glucose can be stored in the liver as glycogen and in skeletal muscles and adipose tissue as well. So glycogen is essentially a store of glucose that can be accessed in times of need. Glycogenolysis is when glycogen is broken down into glucose in those times of need, so in those times of starvation or with long periods between meals in general. Gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources, which we know that the ruminants do quite readily. It happens often with ruminants. Dogs and cats, it's more of an issue. So essentially this is taking typically a fat source, so it's taking peripheral fat from the body and breaking down fat into, um, into glucose, so to derive the glucose from the non-carbohydrate sources. The result of this, of course, is ketones. So this process can be really helpful when the animal's glucose level is low in between meals, but in severe starvation, that fatty acid mobilization from the fat tissue can increase tremendously. So this creates ketones and this overall condition called ketosis. They're a chemical that's a, a product of that fat breakdown. Some tissues can use ketones as an alternative energy source, but too many ketones can essentially cause metabolic acidosis. So long-term breakdown of fat into an energy source causes this byproduct of chemical called ketones, creates ketosis. And then too much ketones floating around in the bloodstream causes an acidic environment. So that's the, that's the downside of using fat as an energy source, as the main energy source. We see this sometimes in cats, typically in cats, sometimes in dogs, who have diabetes that's not overly well controlled, and they get diabetic ketoacidosis, where their blood essentially, because of the accumulation of ketones in their blood, becomes an acidic environment. Not ideal. You may recognize it because the keto diet is very, very common right now, very much a fad on trend. So essentially the keto diet works on that, um, that theory, the benefit of breaking down fat into an energy source. Downside is that if it goes on for a prolonged period of time or if it's done incorrectly and we get an imbalance, then of course the body can become an acidic environment, which is not great. <laughs> Some more functions of the liver. Protein production is so important from the liver. Nearly all the plasma proteins, so the blood proteins, including albumin and blood clotting factors, are created in the liver. And the conversion of amino acids into keto acids is extremely important in energy production and lipid synthesis.
So previously, in a couple lectures ago, we discussed the benefit of albumin, which is a uh, plasma protein. Albumin is an interesting protein because it takes water from the tissues into the veins. So it maintains blood pressure to a degree in that way. Not just the veins, sorry, the vessels overall. So it takes fluid from free-floating areas, so it takes interstitial fluid, and it brings it into the vessels. If an animal has liver failure or liver disease and they're not producing enough albumin, we start to get this condition called ascites. And ascites is an increase in free-floating fluid within the abdominal cavity. So if you think about it, what's happening, we're getting a decrease in the production of proteins, including albumin. Because of this, the albumin's not taking that free-floating fluid back into the vessels, and instead, it's being allowed to just simply circulate within the abdominal wall and the abdominal cavity. Not ideal, but this is a common symptom associated with severe liver disease or liver failure. All right, going back to small intestine. So small intestine motility is, of course, we have two primary movements. We have peristalsis, which we talk about all the time. And then we also have this one called segmentation, which is this small mixing action where it just kind of continuously presses on the food to break it down and mix it. And then digestion-wise, in the small intestine, we have carbohydrate digestion, protein digestion, absorption of monosaccharides, dipeptides, and amino acids, and lipid digestion and absorption, which we'll talk a little bit about. So the summary of carbohydrate digestion, we have three phases. We have a luminal phase, membranous phase, and of course the absorption phase. In the luminal phase, the enzyme alpha amylase is produced by the pancreas and it breaks down starch into smaller chains of glucose molecules. In the membranous phase, the food or the chyme that's passing through has to touch the brush border of the epithelial cells of the inside of the small intestine. When it is touching the brush border of those epithelial cells in the small intestine, the specific enzymes are released for each type of polysaccharide to break it down. So that's the main thing to remember is that in membranous phase digestion, the chyme or the food product actually has to be touching and stimulating those little microvilli in those epithelial cells. And then, of course, the last phase absorption is self-explanatory. They're, absor they're absorbed through the capillaries in the small intestine. Protein digestion. So the goal of protein digestion is to break proteins down into free amino acids. Only free amino acids can actually pass into the blood bloodstream. Luminal digestion of protein actually starts in the stomach with pepsin, and it continues into the small intestine. And the membranous digestion, the enzymes are responsible for membranous protein digestion. They're also located in that brush border of the epithelial cells. So the peptides actually have to come into contact with that brush border within the epithelial cells in order to be broken down fully and release those enzymes to break them down. The absorption takes place through a few different processes. We have passive processes such as simple diffusion, active processes involving, of course, ATP, so cellular energy, and then multiple methods combined, such as transport molecules, secondary active transport, and facilitated diffusion, which we discussed back in the first and second week of school. Lipid digestion and absorption. Of course, lipids are not water-soluble. We know this. So they can't just dissolve in gastrointestinal fluids. There's a four-step process to digest and absorb fat. This is emulsification, hydrolysis, micelle formation, and then, of course, absorption. So emulsification is breaking down in the stomach through bile. Well, sorry, in the stomach first through the warming and churning, and then in the duodenum through the release of bile. Hydrolysis is continuous um, breakdown as well. It's the chemical breakdown through the addition of water. So it's essentially inserting water in between the molecules to break it down further. And then micelle formation is the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bubbles of fat. So the tiniest little bubbles of fat, which are then allowed to be absorbed into the body. Moving on to the large intestine, we'll go through the basic structure and function, motility, regulation of the motility, digestion and absorption, and emptying of the rectum. The cecum. So the cecum is first up, and it's blind diverticulum at the beginning of the colon. So essentially, it's a little blind sac in carnivores. 
very small, doesn't have much of a role in carnivores. It's a large blind tube in ruminants, and it's huge in the equine. So it's really, really big in hindgut fermenters. So not just equine, but of course in rats, rodents in general, and rabbits. Has three parts, the base, the main body, and the apex. And the ilium opens into the cecum, the colon, or both. That is species dependent. Overall, the large intestine has four parts. Most of the time we refer to it as having three parts and having the anus separate. So quite often you'll hear it referred to as the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. Cecum is the area I just described. The colon is a large component of the large intestine. And the rectum is sort of the storage of the bowel movement before it leaves the body through the anus. The anus, it's debatable. A lot of people consider that more so part of the skeletal system, but we can include it with the digestive system in this case. In regard to motility, so the movement of ingesta through the large intestine, it travels very slowly. And the purpose of this is, of course, to allow for absorption of water and electrolytes. The ingesta has to be thoroughly mixed to allow for contact with that absorptive surface. And the motility patterns vary with species. So they could use that segmentation action, peristalsis, anti or reverse peristalsis, whereby if it's not, if there's not enough water absorbed, it can get sent back up further into the intestine and then brought back down. And then of course, bulk mass movements, such as the end result, which is excretion of the bowel movement. For digestion and absorption, the functions of the large intestine mainly are to absorb water and ions, and completion of the carbohydrate or protein microbial digestion and absorption. The horse's fermentation center is the hindgut, and it's positioned after the stomach. So that's why we call it the hindgut. This is where the enzymatic and microbial digestion occurs. Carbohydrates are exposed to enzymes in the small intestine, making them more susceptible to break down by microbes in the cecum and the colon. And some simple carbohydrates may be broken down by the enzymes and acids in the stomach, but in comparison to the carnivore, the enzymatic digestion process that occurs in the horse and the stomach is far less efficient. Hence why they then rely on the fermentation process in the cecums to fully release all of those volatile fatty acids. So the horse cecum is a little bit similar to the ruminant or the rumen in the cow in that it uses microbes to actually process the carbohydrates and break them down into usable fatty acids, volatile fatty acids. So if we look at this drawing here, we have the liver, the right kidney descending duodenum, body of the cecum, right ventral colon, and right, and right dorsal colon. So the cecum itself is quite giant, as well as the colon. It's much more advanced in the hindgut fermenter compared to most species. Lastly, emptying of the rectum, the chyme passes through the large intestine, much of the water is absorbed, and it leaves semi-solid material, feces. Sensory receptors are stimulated when the feces are transported to the rectum, defecation reflex is initiated, and the colon, colon and rectum contract. The inner and outer anal sphincter muscles relax, and of course the need to defecate is perceived by the body, and all of a sudden you're picking up dog poop in your backyard. That is it.